Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo. It is 9.04, June 2nd. Wow, June 2nd. That sounds pretty uh, <laughs> mature. That sounds like we're rolling pretty good into the year, that's for sure. And we're going to be in Esther chapter 6 and 7 today. Kind of getting the narrative just really moving now. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Boy, I had a great night last night with our 20s, 30s group. And uh, we went through the uh, passage in the book of Matthew that was awesome. And um, God, this week's been a teaching week. I think this is my ninth uh, time teaching this week, kind of getting in the word and um, kind of breaking things down. And boy, that's pretty awesome. Um, one of those weeks where you just are in the word a ton and teaching a lot and um, very cool you know it's nice it's kind of you wake up you teach and you go to bed and and you have a group at night and you're doing a teaching so it's neat um, just a real cool week like that so Esther 6 and 7 let's get into this let's read it and see what's happening um, we know that Haman uh, the villain in the narrative has um, a very um, strong, prideful attitude, um, a very, uh, if you will, self-absorbed attitude. And he's excited that he gets to go to this party that uh, Esther has set up just between Haman and the king. But before he, he um, you know, gets there, he wants to set up this pole so he can impale his uh, the guy he hates, Mordecai, on it. And, um, you know, man, super sad situation for sure. And we ha we got a chance to talk about kind of uh, um, Haman's heart and what it was like yesterday. So it says, That night the king had trouble sleeping, so he ordered an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign so it could be read to him. And the those records he discovered an account of how Mordecai had exposed the plot of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the eunuchs who guarded the door to the king's private quarters. They had plotted to assassinate King Xerxes. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? The king asked. His attendants replied, nothing has been done for him. Who is it? Uh, who, um, who is that in the outer court? The king inquired. As it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole he had prepared. So go figure, right? The king, you know, has a, a kind of a dream, a nightmare kind of thing. And he and he wants, he, he just, he's kind of, his brain's just moving. So he has his, one of his like scribes come out and read the laws that he's um, he's done in during his reign, and he reads about Mordecai's awesome um, courage to unveil a plot to assassinate the king, and the king realizes they never did anything. And at that time, Haman comes is going to come and say, "Hey, guess what? I'm gonna uh, I want to impale Mordecai." And so, hey, it's amazing how things just <laughs> tend to work out, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes all we can do is sit back and just go, wow. Some people say, oh, that was fate. But we as Christians go, man, you know what? God's in our life and he's doing something, you know. And there's sometimes times where I can't see what he's doing, but he can work. He can move on other people's life and Sometimes I just don't have enough faith to trust that God's able to touch other people, like a king, right? Like King Xerxes. But God can. And so um, so the attendants replied to the king, Haman is out in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in and the king said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden. One with royal emblem on its head. Let the 
robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Haman thinks it's him. He thinks, man, you know what? The king's been so good to me. Man, this has got to be me. It's got to be me. I mean, look at, look at, man, I am jamming. And the king is not thinking about Haman. The king's thinking about Mordecai, Haman's enemy. Hmm. This is called presumption, right? Presumptuous. Thinking something is going to happen in one way for sure, but it doesn't. You know, hmm, God, am I presumptuous? Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I could see where there's times where I certainly presume upon God. I presume upon others. And and there's times where it's not a good presumption either. And I can see where that happens, where you get filled with that pride. And this presumption comes upon you. And that's something maybe I could work on today, right? Where I could say to God, you know, in my prayer time, hey, God, you know, help me not be presumptuous. You know, just because, God, you're a forgiving God, you know, may I not be presumptuous upon that grace. Mm, yeah. So Haman took the robes and put them on Mordecai, placed him on the king's horse. Wow. That's what he does. He hears what Haman says. He says, let's go do this to Mordecai, the Jew. <laughs> and and uh, so he, they go and they do it. And they lead him through the city square shouting, this is what the king does for someone who honors, uh, wish, he, the king wishes to honor. And after afterward, Mordecai returned to the palace gate, but Haman hurried home dejected and completely humiliated. When Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends, what had happened, his wise advisors and his wife said, since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. While they were still talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. So interesting. I think the response of Haman's wife and friends is really wise. They just go, hey, you know, and they say, hey, you know, this man, you know, the Jewish person has humiliated you. He has not bowed down to you. He's not paid you the homage, right, that you want. And 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 in that way, you're humiliated because he just doesn't respect you. But it, they say, since you're of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. Maybe they knew the history between the Jews and and Na Na Naam's tribe, Naaman's tribe. And maybe maybe they already had a good history of this and they maybe even remembered or heard, you know, wouldn't it be weird if they heard of the the amazing uh narrative of Abraham and God saying to Abraham that, you know, cursed is anybody who is against you guys, you know, um, against Israel. And um, maybe they just knew at this point, like going up against um, Haman is going up against Yahweh. And this is interesting, but remember in the New Testament, <clears throat> when Paul, who was an enemy of Jesus, he was persecuting a guy named Stephen in the book of Acts. Saul, Paul, same person, persecuting Stephen. When Jesus comes to, to Saul, Paul, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Isn't that interesting? Why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul was really persecuting Stephen. But where was Jesus? With Stephen. In Stephen. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. 
very interesting, right? You mess with the Christian and you're messing with the Lord, with Jesus. You're persecuting Jesus. Wow. Talk about a unity there, right? There's a unity with Yahweh and the, the Jewish people. And there's this unity of Yahshua and the church, Jesus in the church. And it says, while they were still talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took Haman to the banquet. Chapter 7. So king, uh, so the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet on the second occasion while they were drinking wine. The king said to Esther, tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you even if it's half the kingdom. Queen Esther replied, if I found favor with the king and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Whoa! Money's been exchanged. Government collusion has taken place. And the the Jewish people will be annihilated according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. Esther reveals this... this, uh, coercion um, and collusion in the government and to the king finally and and you you think maybe the king would just be like hey that's what happens you know collusion and corruption that's what we are that's kind of how it works we'll stop it you know that's a lot of times what seems like happens today right it's like you know Uh, Just keep making money, you know, just keep going, keep going, keep going. There's no kind of like, hey, you know, let's stop, you know, let's just no more. Boop, that's it. It's done. You know, it just seems like it goes on and on and on and on and it just keeps on rolling. Well, let's see what King Xerxes does. And uh, she also says, hey, if, you know, if we would have been sold into slavery, I would have kept quiet. You know, it wouldn't have warranted this. Man, that's intense of a statement, too. But I love the wisdom of Esther, don't you? She just has a wisdom and a knack to her, man. Just a real, she just knows what to say. And she knows when to say it. Got a real tact to how she answers stuff. Um, Laura says, there's been a lot of times that I felt this, I uh, felt I thought I did everything right and deserved recognition for my hard work. However, looking back, I've learned that doing things in my own strength is not what God wanted me to do, but rather I should have put my faith Whoop, let me see more. I should have put my faith and trust in Christ to do things that more in line with the will of God in order that God is given more honor and glory. Yeah, amen. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a presumptuous thing, right? You start thinking one way, like, hey, this is how I think it should go. And yeah, being presumptuous. Yeah, and certainly Haman, man, this is where he was at. That's for sure. And so let's see what happens. So who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded? Who would do be so presumptuous as to touch you? Hmm. Oh, who is struggling with this presumptuous attitude? Hmm. Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining just as the king was returning from the palace garden. The king king exclaimed, Will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. Then Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intends to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king for, from assassination. Then impale him on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Hmm. Wow. That's how we 
finish this the bulk of the narrative of Esther. There's some more to the book, and we will get into that next week and just finish it up and get some good stuff out of there. But we really see Esther just, man, again, so courageous, so full of wisdom. Remember, she's, they've been praying. They've been fasting. They've been really seeking the Lord, um, interceding. You know, Esther becomes someone who intercedes for the entire nation of Israel. And, you know, you might have heard that term like an intercessor, someone who's praying for other people, interceding for them. You know, the Jewish people were very troubled, very worried, of course. They had one year from that decree that they were going to be annihilated. And really, who was going to help them? They were in a foreign land. A lot of their leaders, where did they go? They, they went back to Jerusalem right? To rebuild the temple and, and the wall. And so people were, a small group went back to Israel, but you know, some of that leadership went back to Israel. I bet you the, the nation of Israel was really uptight. Who is going to help? And who is it? It's a young woman. A young woman. How old was Esther? 18? You know, 17? You know, I mean, gosh, she can't be that old, you know. You know, this teenager girl helps out the entire nation interceding. Hmm, amazing. Is that not amazing that that's just put right there? A wonderful biblical book. Doesn't mention God, but you can see the work of God in this young youth right this heart and this gentle heart and this heart that is sensitive and this heart that is discerning and full of wisdom and knows to seek god and really um has a, a tact too you know has a way about taking care of things and seeing things through a, a lot of courage to do so and isn't it something cool about youth? You know, there's something so neat about young people. Um, you know, they're learning so much. They're usually very open to learn. Um, and they're very impressionable, right? Um, and, you know, we can influence people. We can come alongside of them and help them and, and, and really influence their lives for the better. You know, Mordecai was a cousin, the elder cousin of Esther, and really was an amazing person in her life that obviously helped her and shaped her life, her young life. And we see the benefits of that mentorship. Even though he was a male, check this out, even though he was a male, he was a very strong mentor in Esther's life. And they were relatives, of course, but very mentorship oriented as well. Mordecai was like her parent, taking care of her when she lost her parents, you know, so he, he took care of her, saw that she was okay. You can see the investment that this person makes in this young person's life and how cool and impactful that was. So impactful that it literally saved the entire nation of Israel when they were in this captivity. So, you know, hey, keep, Bo, keep investing in young people. You know, keep at it. You know, they are, they can do amazing acts. You know, they have amazing wisdom. Uh, their brains are sometimes just all over the place, but man, can they hone in on a subject and really hammer it through? Um, you know, but just investing in people, you know, that's, I get a lot of that out of the, the Mordecai Esther relationship. And I love the, the idea that Esther intercedes and steps out in faith, um, you know, to, to help out, um, that you pray, but you also have to take the step, you know, you know, you do the prayer, you do the fasting, you seek the Lord, 
but you seek the Lord to take that step, you know, that, that you need to go and have that chat, have that talk. And, and I love Xerxes too, you know, cause, uh, what does he do? He listens, right? A guy who's been pretty, pretty harsh, you know, to his wife in the past seems to like have come around a little bit and he really likes Esther and he definitely treating her a lot better than he did Queen Vashti. And so that's kind of neat too in in the narrative. So a very cool uh, narrative in the Bible. A lot of good things that we can get. You know, Tina says God was her strength. Yeah, absolutely. Um, she probably felt a little bit alone, I would imagine, um, you know, in her position. Um, but she definitely found her strength in the Lord. Um, so very cool, man. I hope you guys get a lot out of those two little chapters and have a great weekend. Um, and I am going to get going in my day. And, uh, um, after a, a long night with those 2030s, woo, they sure know how to do it. Um, but we had a great time and just always fun fellowship, fun time together. So investing in those young people, that's important too, for all of us. So you guys take care. Have a great weekend, okay? We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.